department, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, and the interaction that we get from it is excellent for us, uh, feedback-wise. Uh, my name is Greg Lennon. I'm an acting captain at the police department. I've been there over 25 years, worked a bunch of different assignments. Um, so right now, I'm working the support services division of our police department, more behind the scenes type of stuff. It has to do with dispatch, it has to do with records, it has to do with jail, it has to do with training, it has to do with budgeting, and those type of things, and all the exciting things that you never see on TV. But uh, it's a very uh, cumbersome type of job. It's uh, very interesting, it's a little bit different challenge for me, so I'm uh, right in the midst of doing all that. Uh, I know that there has been quite a few of these meetings in the past, and with the feedback that we got from those, uh, we wanted to change. We have, uh, this is the first one that we've done at nighttime, so we got a little more. Uh, So be happy to answer um, any questions, and I'm going to have a 
to in terms of the format. Thank you. Good evening, again. Uh, for those of you that came in after I made a little announcement about, uh, we have uh, the young lady Laura, who's here from Elios. Uh, they passed out menus. If you want to order while we're going through this, that's fine, go ahead, um, and you can settle up later. Uh, I'd also like to uh, welcome Council Member Jim Krola, uh, who's here as well. And our- Ask him all the tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Jim will. Uh, also in the back, we have Sergeant Joey Nguyen Delgado, who is our uh, supervisor during these hours, okay, which is our swing shift. So it's the uh, uh, patch between day shift and midnight shift, okay? So again, the way it works is if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand about anything. But what we'd like to do first is we'd like to go over some of the changes that have occurred legislatively. Uh, some of the things that we, um, that we ran into, how many folks know what open carry is? Heard about it, read about it? Um, been on the books forever. Recently, the legislation changed to make it a crime to carry an unloaded firearm on your person. It is a crime, okay? It's a misdemeanor under the penal code section, uh, so it's no longer allowed, all right? And I'm sure there'll be uh, other things coming up regarding that, uh, people that want to do something different and maybe they'll get it on the ballot and change again, so who knows? But as for now, it is a crime. We have uh, another one here that I thought was. You read a lot about copper thefts. Okay, it's a big deal. Metal prices went up. Aluminum, copper, nickel, platinum. So then we experience a lot of thefts of those things. Copper wire is in just about anything you can imagine. Copper tubing and air conditioning units. A place like this on the roof, a big store like Lucky, Safeway those kind of places. Their air conditioning units and their freezer units are huge. So they're in the back of the building and it's all run by copper tubing for the water to flow through there. Well, they steal that. They don't care if it's on or not, they'll go and they'll steal it. They collect enough. So now, the crime that, uh, they put that as a crime as well and it, uh, it becomes grand theft to do so, okay? So that's another one that changed uh, legislatively. Stop me if I'm boring you. And that's it, really, that uh, for the penal code sections, it changed. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. You had a question? Yeah. Um, in your experience, when something that wasn't a crime before is made a crime, does it, do people do it less? Or does it make any difference? Well, what happens is you have a lot of these folks that, and usually they're running crews. You know, there'll be more yeah. than one because it's, it's a lot of metal, right? You yeah. take it away. So if you start arresting people because it, it was a crime, it was a theft, anyway. Yeah. But now it's a specific crime and makes it a grand theft, which is a felony. Yeah. Right? So now that it's a felony, they're gonna stay in jail. And I get a citation oh, to go to court later on. Okay. So they're less likely to come back out and do that because then I'm like, oh, uh oh, you know, I'm not gonna do this again. So yes, it does. Is there anything in this new legislation that speaks to the purchasers of this stolen property? Okay. Under okay. these laws Somebody's and, buying it somewhere. Right, yeah, no, absolutely they are. Uh, and it's typically the you know, your iron and metal places that uh, that buy that stuff. Now when they come in and they have huge reams of copper wire or it's on a spool, it's obviously coming from somewhere that uh, it's legitimate. When they're coming in with something that's stamped like, uh, they've even taken headstones and things like that that have brass and stuff. That's when they call us and we do something about it. Those are the legitimate places. Other places, not so much. But it is a crime to receive stolen property. So, and that's a felony as well. Okay, so yeah, we do go after them if, if need be. But that's been on the books receive stolen property. Okay. Uh, one of the other things is our traffic laws. There are a few that have changed. Um, of note, you've heard about the child uh, safety seat. That law has changed and I'm going to let Randy Hutz, or uh, Randy Brand, I always say it because, listen, listen, in my own defense, Sergeant Randy Brand is in charge of the traffic division, right? Myself and Sergeant Hudson look a lot alike. <laughs> they look nothing alike. However, there was Randy Hudson who was before him. So can you see them? It's very simple. It's simple. Are you with me on that? See? It's very simple. Randy Grant, would you please uh, explain that? No problem. As far as uh, the car seats go, the changes that changes under eight years of age uh, are required to be in a car seat or a booster or four foot nine inches and taller. So if you have a seven year old that's really tall, uh, or you have a 12-year-old that's really short, like my 12-year-old, he doesn't need to be in a booster seat any longer. He, he would fight if I tried to put him back in a booster seat. <laughs> so it's one or the other. Is that clear on the law? Uh, 
the reason there's studies and stats that they always run, believe me, if they could put uh, probably even a little taller children in a booster seat, they probably would. Uh, but that's a number they came up with. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I read on the internet about people that are kind of upset about the new laws and said, why don't the car manufacturers just adjust the seatbelt height? Obviously, that's pretty difficult to do. So the way the state's able to kind of intervene is get car seats involved and bring them up to a higher level. Any questions on that law in particular? Do you want me to follow up on the next one that we uh, got some feedback on? Sure, DUI checkpoints. Also, DUI checkpoints, starting January of this year, they're no longer just randomly uh, towing cars for unlicensed drivers, which we used to do in the past. Uh, we ranged from anywhere to 20 to 30 uh, tows a night in the past. We already uh, started using that. We had a DUI checkpoint like the second week in December. Uh, there was probably, I think, 25 citations. I'd have to look at the stats specifically. Uh, a lot of those were unlicensed drivers. We only ended up towing three cars, and the reason was they could not get someone down there to actually physically move the car for them, and we weren't going to leave the car unprotected in the private lot of the business that we were at. So in the past, we'd have, we just had tow trucks basically staged and towing cars. That's no longer going to happen because people thought uh, we were discriminating against different uh, groups for being unlicensed drivers. Any questions on that at all? If you didn't see the numbers on that, we had about 784 uh, vehicles that passed through the checkpoint. Uh, one of the main goals at a checkpoint is more or less education to let people know we're out there to prevent driving under the influence. It's not to arrest people. That's not our goal in the whole thing. We ended up arresting one driver that was under the influence. So it, it was a pretty successful night. A very cold night, but a very successful night. Yes. Um, if you are going into a, a checkpoint and a car turns around, is there, I mean, do you have a certain area where you're blocking off so you all of a sudden somebody's going, oh, wait a minute, there's a checkpoint. I don't want to go through that. Do you follow cars that there's, decide there's they are? There's vehicles in the area that are work, working independently outside the checkpoint that could potentially develop their own probable cause to stop those vehicles. Uh, but no, we don't break people off at the checkpoint to go do that. These are certain numbers that we need to provide in order to keep our checkpoints safe. And as far as a reduce in lane traffic and that, we want to make sure that we're in compliance with the Caltrans laws as far as the distance and cone spacing. Uh, avoid the 21 campaign if you're not aware of what it is. It's all agencies within the county participate, and they have a trailer that is actually specifically designated for agencies that want to use it for the checkpoints. We actually borrowed that trailer this time just because we know all the equipment in it is up to date and everything's within the laws that are required for the checkpoint and actually help things a lot doing it if that answered your question. Yes. If you arrested one I mean maybe I misunderstood you, you only arrested one person during the last one? Right. Does it I mean it doesn't seem like it is a particularly effective use of your time if you're not really catching a large number of people who are drinking or driving. Uh, so do you like to do this because you think it's good or because you have to? First of all, it's funded through the campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, so as far as that night, all of our pay, and we actually came in much lower uh, because officers were willing to adjust their schedules and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as being effective, we had two representatives from MAD there that night, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers with literature, who mm -hmm. were actually at the checkpoint. One of them in particular was uh, a victim of an accident involving a drunk driver just two blocks south of where we were at. Mm -hmm. I think it was 150th, and we were in the 14800 block of East 14th. So just that being there, drivers coming through, and if we spend it, one of the things in the campaign this year that they really wanted to stress on uh, during the kick out, kickoff dinner, uh, mm -hmm. when all the units or all the different agencies were there, and they had actually representatives from MAD speaking, mm -hmm. and a, a young lady that lost her father within, I think it was the past year of a drunk driver, or from a drunk driver, they said really wanted to step up the education side of it. Uh, so yes, the enforcement side's great, but if we could educate 784 drivers mm -hmm. that we're out there, this is the reason we're out here, and provide them the literature that kind of educates them on that, they're going to take that and probably as if, you know, tell all their friends and tell all their family, and if we, you know, prevent even, you know, one or two people from drinking and driving, we've accomplished our goal. Okay. So, if that clear enough. Sir? Okay. Yeah. So, with, with this change in law, it says that uh, you can't, uh, you know, tow a car for a uh, when you identify that a uh, owner or somebody else who is uh, the right owner of the car maybe does have a license. What do you do for those folks that uh, 
are driving and don't have a license. You know, I, I think it, what's going to happen is that these people are going to continue, you know, to uh, to drive. Uh, kind of two sided there. If you're talking about on the checkpoint aspect, uh, we're going to park the vehicle, uh, stage them, bring the keys to it, like one of the officers in charge, whether it be myself or one of the other officers working it, call for relatives to come if they are able to get the vehicle out of there in a reasonable amount of time and it's not going to become a nuisance to the business, uh, we're going to release it to that licensed driver. But on a regular car stop driving down, example of East 14th, it's an unlicensed driver. They've had notice that they've been a suspended driver in the past. we are end up probably towing their car, or at least we could, uh, for driving without a license. So I think that's the area you were looking for, right? The second part I described? Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't change our, our normal traffic stops or you know our, our traffic enforcement stops. It's, this is strictly for DUI checkpoints. Any other questions about any of that? No? OK. Uh, Lieutenant Jeff Tudor is in charge of our criminal investigation division. Um, there was a press release that was put out today, and Jeff's going to explain a little bit about that. Uh, some of you are aware we've had a, a series of strong arm or street robberies uh, in the area of Estadillo, uh, Bancroft, Joaquin, Juana. Uh, they began December 26th, and our last one was January 7th. Um, there's no particular times involved. Uh, there's two suspects. Uh, one is a uh, African American female, approximately 18 to 25, maybe a little bit younger. Um, the other is a male, uh, the same age, uh, about the same age range, and um, no vehicle seen. And what these two are doing is they're basically, and I'll let this is Detective Brown, he's the one who's actually handling the investigation. But what these two are doing is that they are uh, walking around that area, kind of probably targeting uh, uh, individuals walking alone, and there's no rhyme or reason to who they're targeting. Uh, there's been male victims, there's been female victims. Uh, age, the victims' ages have ranged between 18 and 65, yeah. roughly. Um, and the female uh, approaches the victim, uh, has a purse with her, um, basically opens up the purse, says uh, that she has a gun, and asks or demands uh, for, her, for the victim's wallet or purse. Uh, they then flee on foot out of the area. Uh, if you read the press release or were able to get on Facebook or some of the other things or get on the city's websites, uh, I also attached ways to protect yourself as far as uh, how to uh, avoid street robberies. Um, you know, the key that you know, I'm telling people, and I told the press today when I was interviewed, is, is just be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of most of the victims, and I'll let kind of Josh, maybe you can explain more, but uh, most of the victims saw them prior to their robbery, and I'll let you go ahead and kind of discuss that. So in most cases, it's uh, the victim walking along, and uh, there's nothing distinct about the victim. I mean, like we mentioned earlier, Age, height, weight, uh, race, all that other stuff. It's just random. So also with the times. But uh, most victim, victims see uh, male and female suspect together down the block. Then they separate and the female suspect approaches. Either prior to making contact, walks through path or passes and asks for the time. Gets their attention. And then she basically uh, refers to her purse saying, I have a gun. Give me your money. And uh, that's it. Uh, most most people uh, give up their belongings just because of the potential of being shot. They don't want to be victimized. And then both the subjects get meet back together. They're seen getting back together and then fleeing the area of the vehicles associated with other people. And so, uh, as far as uh, any other uh, factors, it, those are just the consistencies that we've had with potentially uh, seven of them. Uh, and it's happened within a week and a half's time. Since uh, the last occasion, we've uh, kind of bumped up our efforts in uh, trying to deter this and let it continue on. And we've taken a very proactive stance. Uh, we've had uh, play clothes, uh, operations, surveillance operations. Our patrol division has done a fantastic job act actively saturating the area. 
uh, to have a high police presence uh, in, in, in that area. Uh, we've actually had off, officers off duty call Josh as they're driving home in their personal vehicles if they see something suspicious. Um, we actually had an officer on his way into work today kind of just driving in and circulate the area. So this has become a, very, a priority for us. Um, I can't get into a lot of the details of the investigation, but Josh is uh, hes one of our newest detectives, and so he's been thrown into the fire very quickly, is actively investigating this case. Um, so hopefully our goal here is that, uh, for one, that no more of these robberies occur, and two, that we bring them uh, to justice here soon. Um, like Josh was saying, you know, I, I, I put it in the press release, but be it, so be a good victim. Um, you know, we, we recommend give the robber what they want. Don't put yourself in a situation to where you're going to get hurt. Uh, obviously, that's a personal decision, um, but that's what we're recommending. If you see something, call it in, report it. Um, you know, some of the in some of the cases, uh, we didn't get to call the call that a robbery had occurred until about a day later. So obviously that. Um, hampers how we respond. So, um, you know, a quick response is usually, is oftentimes a successful response. So, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding that. Yes? Um, first of all, thank you for the press release. I saw it this morning. I walk in that area almost every day to pick up my kids, so it was really useful to have that information. Um, two, um, first of all, uh, what time of the day has these robberies been happening? Are these robberies, that's one of the uh, inconsistencies that we're finding is that, you know, they began in the early evenings, mm -hmm. um, then they were around lunchtime, and then we had some in the morning. Oh. So that, you know, obviously when we're trying to put together a, a quote-unquote plan, you know, those inconsistencies uh, make it difficult. But, you know, that's what poses the challenge right now. Uh, so there's no particular time. Yeah. Um, you know, you oftentimes, you know, people who commit these type of robberies will, uh, you know, do it on certain days or, or certain times. This one's all over the board. Um, no, go ahead. And they're all in the same area? The same general area of the Santa Rosa, Santa Maria, Estadillo. Kind of, yeah, essentially the downtown area. I believe there's one near Washington, or was that on? Uh, Washington was the It was, okay. Um, so there are... Basically, if you a small geographic circle of one another, so that's one of the things that we're looking into. To see if there's, you know, obviously any connection there. Yes. I, I'm sure that you you know this, but the, the the time frame you talked about was exactly the time in which it was uh, um, Christmas break for the high school. Absolutely. Um, but the, my other question is, uh, do you think they have a gun? Um, there's definitely that potential. I would say err on that side that they do have a gun, especially if you're out there walking on the streets. And us as officers, we're going to treat it as if they have a gun. One of the, did one of the I think one of the victims did say they there saw There is a gun. one in the very beginning that mentioned that they, they saw a gun. Okay. Not that it was pointed at them, but yeah, they yeah. saw a gun. The others are just saying that she's making reference to having a gun. Let me just ask one question too. Is, you know, as you know, um, I've got a couple calls about this, and you know, community safety is our priority. And we actually we don't plan for crime to happen, but we plan for things out of the ordinary to happen. We budget for that. And so, when we have um, a person's crimes, a um, uh, high-profile kind of crime like this, and a lot of them happening, we shift our resources and priorities. Um, to solve those crimes. And so we've done that in a variety of different ways. We've done that with our patrol officers. We've done that with our um, ununiformed assignments as well. And um, also put um, overtime funding to, you know, making sure that we solve these types of crimes. And so um, it's not by happenstance they'll get caught. It's um, just uh, when they're going to get caught because um, it is a priority. Again, when we have crimes against persons, you know, you saw that with um, our recent homicide, you know, we were relentless and wouldn't stop until we got someone into custody. And, and a crime like this is no different. Uh, there was another question. In front, right? Someone else had a question? So I was just wondering how, how safe is the state of here? How safe? Well, that's it's either a car jacking or. Um, 
I would say Bayfair safe. I mean, yeah, is there crime there? I think any shopping center, um, relatively speaking, in, in, in the general vicinity has that type of you know property crimes. Um, I don't know what carjacking you're referring to. I don't believe we've well, had one I recently. I haven't read anything about a place that yes. just seemed like for a while there were quite a few. Yeah, I had a meeting actually. I have uh, annual meetings of almost every six months with the security at Bayfair um, Mall and with the property owner. They're very proactive, um, getting involved with the police department, working in a collaborative way so that um, we know their expectations, they know our expectations. Um, we try to educate their security guards of some of the cr crime that's going on. We do have an officer assigned to Bayfair Mall that works as a liaison and is able to pass on information to the Bayfair Mall, uh, to the security guards, to uh, store security. Um, so we really try to take a proactive effort in making the mall uh, a, a safe and a place for you know, our residents to shop. Thank you. But on the flip side, um, Jeff put out some tips and it's ways not to become a victim, and that's whether you're shopping in San Leandro, or you drive to Hayward and shop, or you go over the hill and go to Dublin, is that you really need to be aware of your surroundings. And we see consistently that, you know, maybe victims had a hunch that something was gonna happen, or they weren't paying attention at all. And so, um, people look for, um, suspects look for people who aren't paying attention, and so, um, you know, again, I think the safety of our mall, our mall, like Jeff said, is actually connected to a string of malls. It's not, um, and their security and their management um, are very familiar. There's nothing unusual about what's happening in, in our mall than any of the other types of malls. When you get large groups of people that come together um, and look for crimes of opportunity, it's consistent with, you know, what's happening in the Berkeley malls, um, in Emeryville, and um, so we're well aware of that and, you know, actually take pride because we actually have a police officer assigned there. Some of the other malls and cities don't. I actually know the owners of who runs the security, the, the owners of the security company, so I'm in there all the time, but they're more than welcome. Uh, they really want us to educate their security uh, officers so that, um, I think I can think of one case in familiar where we had a robbery down there and they had a security officer follow the, uh, the suspect until we can get in the area and did exactly what a good witness does, uh, provide great descriptions. So uh, we've seen the benefits of educating um, you know, the mall security through our mall officer and then well, obviously with the meetings that we have with them. Any other questions regarding that? All right. Any other questions? Well, these folks are up there and can absolutely answer for you. If they can't, they're going to throw sand down and they're going to tap dance around. So go ahead and raise your hand and let us know. Oh, no, go ahead. I have, I have a, I many. I guess this is to the chief. Um, what does the police department waste money on? Pardon? What does the police department waste money on? Waste money on? Yeah. So I don't know where you're at. What, what's your kind of question? What's your real question? Well, that's a real, that is a real question. I, you know, I, I'm thinking of your budget, yeah. the city's budget. Yeah. And, you know, what are wasteful areas within the police department? So I like to describe it as, you know, I have X amount of money in our budget, and what do we do with our money? And then I like to look at what is our budget compared to other police departments' budgets um, per capita. And per capita, most police departments are budgeted at a rate of anywhere between maybe as low as like two, $250 per capita versus um, some departments go as high as uh, $550 to $600 per capita. We are under $300 per capita. Um, as our budget for our police department. And so what that says when, in terms of financing is that um, we're at bare bones for the services that we provide. And if you compare our services to other cities and the services they provide to the public is um, from a police department standpoint, we offer a lot more services than many other departments offer as well. So as a resident, I would think, am I getting the biggest bang for my buck from the police department? And that's probably a piece of your question. And I can tell you, you absolutely are. For um, 
a city this size at less than $300 per capita, um, you are getting a good value for your dollar. I also get asked the question, you know, how many police officers do you need? You know, right now we have as many police officers as we can afford. We have 89 storm police officers, five grant officers um, that we'll lose in um, 18 months plus a year. So in about two years that we could potentially lose if there is not additional funding for them. And when we drop to, you know, below 85 officers, you know, we have to look at prioritizing services and what's the most important. And what the most important is that I'm hearing from the community and talking to our staff is, you know, keeping the city safe, solving violent crime. It's great to have the community outreach, but we're going to need to prioritize that if we continue to lose police officers. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. I think that there is opportunities in government um, to do better with your dollars. So I think we look at um, sharing services with other agencies. What can we do jointly that we can share to reduce the costs to both agencies? So we're looking at opportunities with our neighboring agencies of, you know, what can we do together to reduce some of the costs on both of our sides? Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Well, when you came in a year ago and you looked at the priorities the city has, has up to that point, and looked at what you saw as being the needs and what it and what the city wanted. I was just wondering, did you see things that we don't really need this? I don't think the city needs this. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. So um, I think that before I got here, there were a lot of staffing reductions. And so right now, um, when I got hired a year ago, you know, I took a look, look at where is our staff and our resources. And right now we're shuffling some of our staff and resources to really meet the needs of the citizens. I think some of the areas you're talking about is things that um, other cities are looking at and things that we're looking at as well is, um, you know, we evaluate services like we have our own jail. People think, you know, you get rid of your jail and that's going to save you $800,000 a year or a million dollars a year. And it doesn't necessarily take uh, save a million dollars a year because we arrest between 10 and 15 people a day. All those people need to go to jail and it costs triple to book them in the county jail than it does to our own jail. And so there's a cost value and assessment and taking a look at um, what is the best service and what is the best dollar. But there may be different ways to do those services. Right now, we've purchased um, a brand new CAD RMS system to run our computer system for our police reports and our dispatching. And um, it is such a robust system. We can take on other cities as clients and provide them that service and actually gain some revenue from that. So we're looking at opportunities like that that we can gain revenue. Um, you know, animal control, you know, you can look at things like that and how can you share services with another city and maybe charge another city for those services because you're not utilizing those services at 100%. So that's right now, you know, what we're looking at is opportunities. But when I go back to what I talked to before is budget-wise, um, the majority of our budget is personnel. The other pieces left in operation, it's very slim. So per capita, you know, you're getting a lot for your money. Um, for the small amount of money per capita that the police department is costing. Does that sort of answer your question? Sort of. Do you have something specific that, you know? No, no, it's, it's very open-ended. Yeah, I just wanted to see where you would go with it in terms of, you know, um, looking at the city and the needs and, you know, people come on board and just, just like I'm sure this new city manager Probably looking at the city and looking at the money and what's really needed and it's not in terms of their perspective. But, sure. You know, I'm just wondering where you know, where you were leaning and what you thought was wasteful and what was a, more of a priority. Well, I can tell you, safety and security is the biggest priority, and that's where we shift our resources and our money. To be quite honest, we have um, two school resource officers, one now that's funded on a grant, so we have three school resource officers. Um, that, is in, that is barely enough school resource officers to cover our high school and the ninth grade campus. We have middle schools and elementary schools that don't get the attention of a school resource officer. And so when you look at you know, um, sort of the way we're spreading our resources, you know, we really um, spread our resources and, and they're spread quite thin. 
um, I was asked, you know, maybe can you um, look at the opportunity and get rid of the SWAT team? You know, it's sort of wasteful, um, wasteful spending the money. But the reality of it is we use our SWAT team about once a month. And um, we have about 15 officers that are specially trained, working 24 hours a day when they're not doing SWAT activity. And when you talk about the biggest bang for your buck, this city needs once a month you need a large team to come together to take on some sort of criminal element. Um, I can call the sheriff maybe once or twice a year and he would do that for free, um, but he's not gonna come out 12 times a year and send his resources to help the city of San Leandro when we need it in a crisis. And so when I look at for the biggest bang for our buck, um, we're really getting our money's worth for spending our resources on something like that. So uh, we are taking a look at um, where we're spending and spreading our dollars. Um, and I think there's opportunities in the future, but um, you know, right now we're doing some internal uh, reorganizations to sort of meet the needs of the future. I mean, you would think in a city our size we would have a crime analyst, right, that analyzes crimes and person's trends out. I mean, who thinks we have a crime analyst? Most cities do. Okay, you probably got that, we don't. <laughs> so we don't have a crime analyst. And right now we're shifting, and I'm not going to get any more money. I can't go to the city council and say, hey, can I have about $100,000 more for a crime analyst? No, I have to look within my budget, and how can I shift my money to bring on a crime analyst to meet the needs of the city and meet the needs of future um, you know, public safety to make sure that we as a community are safe. And so that's sort of where I'm at right now. I would think you would have the skills to analyze crime. I have, you know what, you're probably right. I do have the skills, but I don't have, there's only 24 hours a day. <laughs> and, and the other people that you work with, I mean, sure. I, why bring in something that we think you, you guys are supposed to be experts at? Sure. Um, crime analyst, being a crime analyst is quite um, intensive, and it actually is a specialty. And it's not just analyzing crime internally, it's actually taking crime from the area. Um, including outside the city and bringing it in and analyzing it. And it's not just analyzing criminal activity, it's analyzing trends as it relates to um, gang activity, as it relates to crime, um, as it relates to the other things that are happening and connecting that to our city. So uh, we don't have one person um, specifically to do that. And it's um, pretty important that uh, we shift our resources to get somebody to specifically do that. Yeah. My husband and I lived for 16 years, and we have a pretty strong neighborhood watch on Victoria Avenue. And when you talk about a full service police department, I just want to compliment your department on the very fast response you get when you call something in. And because of that, we caught some burglars, and we caught a alleged sex offender. Um, the response is so quick, and I know someone who lives on Durant, and when she sees something, she calls her neighbor across the street on the San Leandro side. Have them call oh, the Police yeah. Department because they respond faster than <laughs> Right. And Tim gave a very sobering um, statistic one time. He said, What's our total population? It's about what? So the sign says 80 is going to be. Yeah, he said there's something like 175,000 people a day who come to these Easily. Easily. Yeah. Because they're going to work, they're commuting, they're going from one city to another. That's a tremendous amount of traffic. And so to be able to have such a fast response, when you've got that kind of traffic, um, I think we are very fortunate to have a full service police department. And there is a difference. I've lived in Alameda, Castro Valley, Oakland. There is a difference in response time with the other city. So thank you. Yes, uh, before I take another question, I just want to say in regards to Victoria and her block, a big hand because they got the speed bumps that they've been waiting for quite some time. I live on Victoria too. And I don't like the speed bumps. Uh-oh. You know, the children that live on our street don't play on the street. It's not about the children. It's about the car accidents we've had. It's about the airborne escalator over the Kenilworth dip. It's about backing out of the driveway and really getting hit. There were, and it was an overwhelming response by the neighborhood to have the speed bumps. And we're going to see a And it was done properly, too. So Five years. Petitions, yeah. meetings, yeah. it was done properly. Margaret, you had a... Go ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, speaking of uh, response, you know, with uh, you know, dwindling uh, you know, resources out there, uh, uh, there are uh, you know, many departments that uh, 
are uh, you know, severely understaffed and you know, when, when in, in some cases, for example, if you call uh, and you know, if you have a uh, burglar alarm and uh, they may or may not respond depending upon whether they verify that it's a, uh, you know, a, an actual uh, alarm uh, or not. Or uh, actually, see, I work in, uh, in Hayward and we had an incident that happened last night at about, you know, probably around 9 o'clock where uh, there was a, uh, an intruder that came into our building. And it took, I think, about, I think it was about two hours before an officer uh, finally responded. You know, uh, is that, is, hmm? In Hayward, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, so in, in general, is that something that's reasonable? So here's the deal on uh, verified responses and alarms, and sort of my personal opinion is, you know, it's a catch-22 for us. First of all, um, we thrive and love to catch criminals. And so if your alarm goes off and we get to home your business, and there's a criminal in there or someone who broke in and we can arrest them. I mean, you, we've not only made your day, we've made our day because we feel like, you know, that's a great system. But the biggest problem is, is 99.6% of alarms that go off in this community and every other community are false alarms. And so when an alarm company comes and sells you an alarm, they're saying, here, you need to get this alarm and pay us all this money and we'll just have the police department respond. Oh, don't worry about it. They're just going to come and respond. And so they're selling a service on the backs of government and saying, I'm making my money, my big industry, I'm making all this money off alarms, and oh, we're going to rely on government to come back us up, and we don't get a dime on that. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it, it's sort of, um, there are model um, ways and model sort of ordinances that can be put together. We have a really good ordinance. Um, and there's ways to make it even better. Um, I don't necessarily agree with verified response. I know that the city of Fremont does it, and unless they know someone's there, they're not going to go, or it's going to take them two hours. So I think in this community, what works is we are going to continue to respond to alarms as long as we have staffing available. I think we can make improvements on our alarm ordinance so that it puts more on the onus on the alarm company to make sure that um, they don't get false alarms to make sure that they're doing regular maintenance on the systems and so that and they're training their customers on what to do when their alarm goes off so that we don't get those calls because the last thing you want as a community member is it's a two-person response at least we go to the alarm we act like somebody's going to be there so you're going to get two officers so you don't want two officers dedicated to one area and you have an emergency at your house and you, it's a false alarm so there's a balance there so um, we will respond to all alarms. I think in the future you can see us kind of taking a look and seeing what can we do to reduce the amount of false alarms that we have. And uh, there's ways to do that. Are there fees for false alarms? There are. It's a sliding scale. I think you get three for a year. Three, yeah. Three for a year, and then after that, maybe $50 or $100. That's for a new homeowner So for, to me, yeah, it doesn't so, seem like it's worth paying. So it doesn't, right? Um, and so for over 20 years in this business, I've told people, um, you don't need an alarm. Because if you lock your doors and make sure everything's secure and don't leave hide the keys around, I, I feel and I felt for 20 years, you don't need that. Um, so five years, I, five years ago, I was a victim of a burglary. <laughs> uh, my home was closed and I locked all the windows and the doors. And I mean, it's a long story. My husband, for some reason, took the locks off the windows because one day he's going to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> and he never did. <laughs> so but the windows were closed. That's another story. And, and, yeah, that's another story. <laughs> and you know, the windows were closed, and, and they were able to get in. And um, literally, it was the first moment. And every piece of jewelry I ever owned is gone, and um, a lot of personal property I'm never going to get back. And I just sort of realized that we are in the days of, um, you know, you need to do what you can to protect yourself, whether it's an alarm, whether it's getting a neighborhood um, group together. You know, what works better than alarms in this community is the neighbor across the street who's very nosy calling and saying, you know, I don't know why my, these people are taking the big screen TV out of my neighbor's house. I swear they just got that for Christmas. And um, just making the call. And so, 
If you can't afford an alarm, there's other things that you can do. You can call um, Tim and get Carrie or Tim to come out to kind of take a look at your house to see what options um, that you can do to make better security. You know, we had shrubs on the side of the house that we took down, sort of made a fortress, uh, fortified some of the, the, the side doors so people couldn't get over. And there were certainly things that we could have done better. So do you need an alarm? No, if you can't afford it, there's other options. Uh, you know, by having a neighborhood watch, be more proactive with your neighbors, and doing other things to fortify your home to make it more secure. Um, homes that are fortified like that, better, and I'm not talking about gates and wrought iron and fences, I'm just talking about um, doing things reasonably because they'll pass over your house to go to another home. You it know, takes it more time. That, yeah, exactly. So, I think um, a dog, or they see motion detectors. A dog. I mean, did your wife want a dog? We have a dog. <laughs> 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 oh, dog. But there's, you know, there's things like there's really small things you can do that make your home less attractive, and they'll move on to another home. Yes, sir. Hey, um, follow up on his uh, point and the, uh, the alarm situation. Uh, I really appreciate learning a lot more about alarms and things like this tonight. That's a great thing. And I have a couple of thoughts. One uh, might be a revenue opportunity, uh, and that's that, okay, if the alarm company is going to come out and say, we're going to put in the alarm and then connect it to the police department and they're going to respond, how about, uh, how about, yeah, a small portion of your monthly fee goes back to the police department to create an opportunity for increased staffing to deal with those alarm calls? Um, that seems like that'd be kind of a fair deal. I mean, why why should we have this special connection between my house and the San Leandro Police Department if I'm not chipping in? So we don't have a direct connect. Uh, the way an alarm works is an alarm gets called, is that right? Yeah. Right. So um, the alarm gets called into your alarm company and then they get <coughs> this, so it's not direct. Okay. Okay. And so the best practice in the industry right now, um, and I've worked with um, sort of the statewide alarm companies um, representative and they say the best practice is actually to reduce false alarms versus continue to go on and, and try to create revenue so really what they want to do is reduce false alarms and there's many ways you can actually work with the community to actually reduce those numbers okay. um, the other comment was uh, in our neighborhood we had a house that was broken into recently uh, the keys went to the garage door um, we have a neighborhood where most folks do know everybody else in the neighborhood. And the, the house that was broken into was right next to another house in which a, both people are retired and are at home most of the time during the day. And somehow, um, it just nobody knows what was going on there. Although, um, we, this house has been broken into several times, so we almost kind of have a feeling that somebody's watching it. And that maybe they notice that the people next door were around or something. So it's uh, it's it's tough. Uh, so that's um, not unusual, and um, for somebody to uh, keep an eye on a home before they're going to burglarize it. And I go back to the neighborhood watch and being proactive neighbors. So we will get a call from your neighborhood of this car does not belong here and it's been parked here for five minutes or two minutes or they just parked here we don't know them. And it might seem like a small call, but it's a really important call to us because sometimes we catch people that are you know, checking out a neighborhood and just walking around and they're really profiling the homes. So, so anytime I see any vehicle that's a strange vehicle where somebody <coughs> is sitting there uh, not doing anything in particular, it would be appropriate for me to call and say, hey, heads Absolutely. up. Okay. Absolutely. And apparently the other, the other uh, problem thing are uh, guys on bicycles. Yep. Uh, which is really a problem because obviously there's no plate on a bike. Yeah. However, here's the deal. We, you know, we have 10-hour shifts and we have 12-hour shifts for the officers at work patrol. So out of a 10-hour day, four days a week, let's say when they work the 10-hour shift, they're in your neighborhoods. They're in your areas depending on what beat they work on. Alex is working B3 right now. B3 is a fairly large beat and it, it borders every beat, other beat in town with the exception of one, which is beat one on the north end. So there's a lot of calls for service, but he's got a lot of time. If, if Alex, who just now came back to patrol, he um, starts working more than three weeks to a month in the same area, we start to notice what belongs and what doesn't. 
but we don't know as well as you folks who actually live in that neighborhood. So you'll know when something's out of place. You know when somebody's acting suspicious. Calling us, it's not a bother to us. We'd rather do that than come out three hours later and take a report with nothing to show for it and everything's gone. So yeah, absolutely call every time. Okay, so if I, if I come home and I see a funky looking vehicle and several kids standing out in front of the house smoking pot, it's okay to call? Call us. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So taking on on the, on the pot angle, uh, one of the things that the police department seems to do a lot, at least many of your press releases, are about busting grow, uh, marijuana grow operations. Now, as somebody who is not involved in this at all, it makes me think that if we are actually closing down the growth operation here, if we're just basically helping the Mexican drug cartels you know, by getting rid of their local competition. So what I, I want to understand how is getting rid of growth, growth operations useful? So let me, um, let me just start by answering is, um, it's interesting about these, let's go, let, let's, let's look at how this impacts San Leandro and not talk about the Mexican cartels, right? Because that's just like this bigger issue. Um, a lot of these calls we get because the homes are blight in the neighborhood mm -hmm. um, and they're causing a community and quality of life problems. This constant traffic going in and out of the homes in a residential neighborhood, um, various um, just criminals going on and about a street. Um, also the theft of PG&E, hundreds of thousands of dollars where they hook into PG&Es from their neighbors and steal. Um, and, and, then, and then one of the bigger issues is um, the complete fire hazards. We're going into homes that are not even inhabitable. They are actual grow homes. They have, you know, an infestation of, you know, animals and rodents. And, and so let's just talk about how it impacts San Leandro is um, many of these are calls for service that we get. Um, they're creating quality of life um, issues in our neighborhoods. Um, and they're also bringing criminals to your neighborhood um, to sell and buy and grow this. Uh, the case, if you want to talk about the case, yeah. yeah the, actually, the press release that I, I'm going to stand because my legs are getting <laughs> uh, The case that, the press release that you're talking about this morning actually was an excellent job by our investigators. It was a month long investigation. Uh, they got uh, some tips of some suspicious activity, possible drug activity. Um, from uh, the community, from the residents, so we thank you for that. You know, we thank those, if, I don't know if anybody in this room is from there, but thank you. Um, our investigators looked into it um, and were able to obtain a search warrant um, for the residents. It was on the 3400 block of Carrillo Avenue. Uh, what is unique about this case, yes, there was, there was a marijuana grow, but they also had uh, powder to make ecstasy, um, which is kind of a party drug, it's a stimulant. Uh, they also had two assault rifles, one with a banana clip, which is an extended clip that can shoot multiple rounds, five handguns, um, and actually when officers entered the residence, one of the assault rifles was hidden above to where right exactly where the suspect was standing that would be easily accessible to them, which could have been a very tragic incident if he, uh, that suspect chose to grab that weapon. So um, these cases, like the chief mentioned, um, in this particular case, you're getting uh, people with criminal records into our neighborhoods. Uh, you're getting their friends into their neighborhoods, but often, oftentimes, because of the drug element, we get residential burglaries or residential robberies, or uh, where a botched dope deal would, hap uh, would happen, and, and then we get possibly a homicide. So there's a laundry list of things that these grow houses bring to your neighborhood. And, uh, and I can ask some of your community members if, I mean, do you want that in your community? Absolutely. You've got your children. Yeah. Actually, I've got uh, I've got a section section eight house right next door to my house. Uh, you folks were over there last uh, Tuesday or this last Tuesday. A bunch of folks were over there, and there were all sorts of interesting people that they found over there. Uh, the activity has slowed down a bit recently, fortunately, because they know that the rest of the neighbors are now trying to get them evicted. Um, but yeah, they've had all sorts of strange and bizarre folks in there and, and over a period of years, and it's, uh, it's a major hazard. Yeah. And, and you know, we take those community issues and those community problems serious. 
I know when I uh, when I would work at B, I love those the challenge. Right here's a problem area that's causing problems to the neighborhood. Uh, you know, being born and raised here, if you know, I wanted to clean up the streets. I have family here. I have friends here still. Um, you know, I don't. I, I have that vested interest to where I don't want to see. Um, you know, my friend that I went to school with for you know 20 years. Now he's living somewhere, or you, or anybody else that lives here in San Leandro. Um, so when we get these these grow houses, um, there's a much bigger problem other than the marijuana. Um, in this particular case, we're this is an ongoing investigation that we're looking into uh, if these people are involved in other crimes unrelated to drugs and unrelated to weapons violations. So um, you know, it's it's one of those issues that um, that. It's very rewarding for us when we do take down a grow house in the San, in San Leandro because of the impact that it's having uh, on the community. Resale value, mold inside the house. Some of these houses are just mold everywhere. So now, you know, they get those people out. Now the, the person who owns a house is going to has to pay all this money, and then the resale out value for your home. So there's much bigger issues. Uh, and I can tell you, and I'm sure any one of these officers here can tell you, that when we handle a problem house in San Leandro and get rid of that problem that benefits you, that's, that makes our day. That makes our job. We can go home at the end of the night um, and, you know, look ourselves in the mirror and say, you know what, job well done. And, um, you know, we thank you. We thank you for your support. Um, it's very nice to work in a community that you support us. You give us feedback. Um, you give us the support that we need to go out there and do our jobs. <coughs> so, please, in, in, in this case, uh, we got two assault rifles off the street, five handguns, and um, we were able to take the bad guys to jail. So, and, it's um, always a good thing. Yeah, let me talk about there's the flip side. Um, there's the Compassionate Use Act, right? Prop 215. And we as a police department comply with that. So if we have somebody who's in compliance under Prop 215, we comply with the rules of Prop 215. Uh, there's a bigger issue of um, the sales and distribution and growing of illegal drugs. And um, we don't get to decide in San Leandro which, which laws we enforce and which laws we don't, right? So we comply with the federal and state laws as it applies to the sales and distribution of marijuana. On the flip side is, um, again, we believe in, um, on the compassionate use side, that if somebody has the appropriate paperwork, we comply with that and we don't take enforcement action because um, that's what the law says in that area. So, so there's two sides to that. And we encourage it, like she said, if you, know, you uh, have the right to grow marijuana, we encourage you to call us and let us know I don't plan to them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that we're aware. Because, you know, oftentimes, you know, we do get calls. I don't know how many our detectives go pretty consistently get reports of sus mm -hmm. suspicious activity. People are in compliance. And, you know, there's no enforcement action taken. But we know where those places are. Yeah. Right? And, and we, if the people who are running the honest cultivation operations, they're the ones who are telling us about it and working with us uh, and, their, and their neighborhoods probably know about it and they're the ones who are getting involved. It's the illegal ones like Jeff put the press release out on that you're hearing about because that's a growing trend in the narcotics world. Uh, it's not just isolated to that one house. More often than not, the trend is, is that you have 10, 15, 20 of those houses spread throughout the whole Bay Area. And it's not just San Leandro. You may have one house here, you may have one house in San Lorenzo, you could have three in Hayward, you could have four in Oakland, you could have them all the way out Tracy. And they're all part of the same group? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So you now have, uh, you know, more sophisticated, sometimes criminal gangs are involved in them, sometimes you have major uh, drug traffickers involved in them, sometimes it's just your average Joe mm -hmm. who's out of work doing it to make money. So, you know, it's no set person who's doing it per se, but it, it's a big trend in that area, and it's obviously something that we need to look at as a part of and take action on. And they're becoming, um, these grow houses, they're becoming victims of burglaries and robberies. So, you know, again, that attracts people to your neighborhood that you don't want to come rob a grow house and take all either their equipment or the plants. So, um, and oftentimes they're used to fund other illegal activities. Um, you know, 
well beyond the drug world. So uh, it's it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> <laughs> but can I ask? You, so what? I mean, what percent? I mean, not that I have any idea how many there are, but how many would you say of the ones you have busted have been part of? an organized crime sort of a scheme rather than the average Joe with you know, a few plants. You know, I have to I mean, go back and look at each case. I mean, obviously, we do cases not just in San Leandro, but mm -hmm. where we can develop a case. Um, but I would say more, more often than not, it's either gang-related, uh, crime-related. You know, yeah, there are those cases where it's someone that just needs to looking to make some extra money yeah. because they're unemployed. Uh, but most of the, the, the individuals our detectives are contacting and arresting are people that are heavily involved in crime. Okay. Not just drugs, but weapons, okay. uh, counterfeit, uh, identity theft. Um, so, you know, again, cases like this are rewarding to us. I mean, Again, it allows us to look, look ourselves in the mirror and say, hey, we're doing a good job here and we cleaned up the neighborhood. Well, so I apologize for my comments today. Oh, <laughs> no problem. You can call me too and we can talk it out. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions about that or anything in your neighborhood? Yes, sir. We do have a SWAT team. We have a very good SWAT team. Uh, two former members here. Uh, well, Randy can probably talk to them. Randy's a one current one member of the team leader. One of the team leaders. Um, what questions about it? If specific questions about it, or you just want to know if we have one? We do. We have an active SWAT team that works a lot with the out, outer agencies around us. Uh, we work with some of the federal agencies and cities around us because a lot of the things recently have become like a collaborative effort. Whether it be like multiple search warrants, like they're talking about. Uh, whether it's regarding marijuana grows, the robbery suspects we're looking for, lead us into another jurisdiction. So a lot of times we work with other agencies to kind of become more familiar with their operations. But yes, we, we train twice a month. Uh, those people are out on the street, uh, a good, pretty much a portion of the day. If we have three crews on during a week, the Monday through Thursday schedule, there's a good chance that a couple of our members are out with those crews and they're able to supplement with that uh, experience that they have. Like for instance, if something happened right now in the city and we're monitoring it, we would go and supplement the patrol force that's there. And that expertise that we learned from those two days a month, we're able to bring in and plug into whatever the critical incident is and hopefully they'll have a positive outcome based on that training. That's able to answer some of the questions. A lot of former military members on the team, a lot of people like for myself, I was at, at a mark in my career where I wanted to really if you, if you look at studies on police officers and officer safety, there becomes a certain point in your career where you start becoming complacent and you're losing the edge from the academy and some of the training that you're provided. So I was at that point where I wanted to continue training, get more training. That's why I joined the SWAT team. That's why I'm able to get more training and I'm able to bring the training I learned elsewhere to our agency to the officers that aren't on the team any longer uh, to train them on matters too. That answers some of the questions. Don't let them fool you, though. It's because of all the neat stuff they get to wear. <laughs> we have a very, if you watch, uh, if you were able to watch our SWAT team um, in action or working, even if they were just training, um, a lot of us, uh, well, quite a few of us have done training with them as either role-playing as a victim or role-playing as a bad guy hiding out somewhere. Uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, I never knew that they entered the room. It was too late. I couldn't react. Uh, they are they're really good and they're fun to watch uh, what it is that they do. And they get, done, uh, they get things done quickly uh, and it's a lot safer than a bunch of cops willy-nilly just trying to go in and, and trying to make somebody uh, uh, comply with whatever it is we need them to comply with and arrest them. Uh, it's a lot safer this way, and that's why we use it. Yes. And in 2010, I watched the house, the house across the street. I watched the SWAT team in action. So I had a nice view right across the street. How they do? Excellent. Did you give them a good rating? Well, I, I do have to say that the neighbors on the west side of them are kind of stupid because they're walking around trying to get a good view. And, the, the woman's having her grandson move the car, and she's looking in the garbage can, and there's police with guns out there. I'm like, what are you, crazy? We wanted so, to get a fair view. If I could just comment, you know, one of the things is you talk about every city has a different philosophy. So if in Hayes,
Hayward, it takes them two hours to respond. That goes to just general policing. And it goes to the SWAT team too. So our SWAT team represents the philosophy of our city, um, of our public safety, and of the community. And so we respond appropriately to uh, the temperature and the climate of the community by bringing in other SWAT teams, which we have to do sometimes if there's a long-standing um, incident. Um, but they don't carry the same philosophy because they come from the philosophy of whatever city or area they work in. And it is, we have seen it significantly different. And so one of the benefits, I go back to the benefits of having our own SWAT team is um, it is a fairly a team that's used fairly often and it carries the philosophy you know, of our community, which is really important. How many women do you have on your police department? And are any of them on the SWAT team? Uh, we don't have any women on the SWAT team right now. We have a fairly diverse team, uh, but we have no women on the SWAT team. Uh, and we only we have, I think, six women. Seven. 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 This is probably a little strange question, but it comes uh, from a historical perspective. Uh, we've been living in San Diego for a while. Um, I, my impression from hearing everything that you shared tonight is, is great. Uh, it sounds like uh, you've got some terrific ideas and we're doing some, some really nice things. And so I'm, I'm really excited about the possibility that you won't be retiring anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited about that too. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, um, although I never remember my age, um, I have many years. <laughs> um, You're probably like my wife, 16 going on 17. Yeah, something like that. Um, yeah, but I have uh, many more years of service set to give, so I have no plans to retire, so thank you. You know, and quite honestly, you know, when you take this position, I think um, it, it comes with a great deal of responsibility. And to impact change and make a difference, especially in the community coming in as the police chief, is, um, you know, the minimum kind of commitment is three to five years. That's sort of how you can in, impact change, and that's sort of the cycle of change. And so, you know, I think it's sort of, um, you know, I don't know as far as the history, and I know that, you know, there's been retirements and some short-term chiefs, but for me and sort of the industry standard that you're seeing now is um, longer-term chiefs who make commitments and, you know, they can really make a difference in the community and in the department. Obviously, they had a, a bit of a problem with that in Oakland, but I think there's some other political things going on that complicate the issue. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, I was going to say, okay. I, huh? I didn't next door for that. Swap team, that house is swap team Oh my gosh, you certainly make a lot of noise. <laughs> they sounded like Danny Roosters. <laughs> and they went through the back door, I meant into their garage, and just burst it wide open. And, but there was no one there. I'm one of the quiet ones. <laughs> I was, you know, I, I, there's a lot of tools that we carry with us that make most of the racket. Uh, we it try to the ramp part. Yeah, there's a lot of tools. Some of it's done intentionally. Uh, some of it is done uh, by design uh, uh, to distract. And, but obviously, when you have a SWAT team going in and they're making a high risk entry. The person on the other side of the door needs to know who it is, so there's no question later on, two years from now when it goes to court, that nobody can say, I didn't know it was the police. And I appreciate When you're the, the neighbor across the street, the one that lives three doors down, and you, you know, oh my gosh, what's all this racket, and you know it's the police, three doors away, it's kind of hard for them to make that their defense, like, hey, I didn't know it was the police. What's very impressive is the robocalls. When we had a shelter in oh, place wow. last year, our two cell phones and our home phones started ringing all at the same time. Oh, the coverage. Yeah, that's that was, that's a nice system. That's a very nice system. We've used uh, the code red, I think. I was just asking uh, one of our lead dispatchers if, uh, if we've used it recently, because I hadn't heard, and I guess we did here just before Christmas. Um, and so they're using it quite a bit. When we first got it, uh, it was new, it was new to the community, it was new to us. So that uh, system has the ability to enlarge an area or dial it down as small as we want uh, for the phone calls to go out. How many don't know what uh, code red is? Anybody? Everybody pretty clear on what it is? Yeah, I'm not just there. there. Um, you just enter your address, phone number, some basic information, and you're, you're on the system, you're logged on. Um, so now the dispatchers are pretty, they're good with it. And uh, once the you know, on-scene uh, personnel say, hey, listen, can you initiate code red uh, for this area? They'll take care of it. And uh, you, 
you get that message. If you're not home, they leave it on um, the voicemail. Uh, if you have a system that picks up onto your cell phone from, it'll alert you there too. So, um, so I need to sign up. You go on. Uh, it's uh, to sailando.org, and uh, you, it'll show a code red. You click on that, and it'll tell you how to. It's just real basic information. You're not sharing a bunch of information for, to work once you're in here. Yes, sir. Sure. Well, I do have a question about uh, you know, technology, but I know a lot of number of people have uh, made some comments about uh, SWAT team. Uh, yeah. Over the last couple of years, I've participated uh, with the uh, Sheriff's Department and uh, so many other local agencies in uh, the uh, upper, uh, Urban Shield exercise. And I have had the opportunity to see some of the local uh, agencies. Matter of fact, I, I had no idea, for example, that BART had a SWAT team. Uh, but, um, you know, they are, they are really are quite impressive. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was really, I was really impressed by the, uh, the FBI team. It's like with almost no communication at all. These guys came in and they got the job done. So it was, uh, and, uh, some of the other agencies here do a uh, great job with that as, uh, as well. But uh, the main question I have is, as long as we're talking about uh, you know, technology, uh, you know, it was mentioned that you know, the department was you know, starting to look at using you know, technology. So I'm now familiar with uh, the program. But are they doing other things like uh, uh, a lot of people who uh, sign up for text messages or emails or uh, that there's other uh, you know, web-based you know, technologies that uh, departments use to get information out? Is that something that's... Yeah. I'll let the chief answer that because I still have a problem with emails. So. And, uh, I'm going to let Jeff answer some of the technologies um, in a minute. But there, there are a couple things um, that we're doing. As, as our population has increased over the last few years by actually a lot, um, we have not increased our staffing in our dispatch center. And right now, we don't meet the industry standard and the state standard for answering our 911 calls at a certain percentage. So instead of maybe uh, two rings, it takes us three rings. So we need to better meet the standards. And our dispatchers, our dispatchers answer, I don't know, over 100,000 100, calls per year. And there's usually two of them in there at a time. And so we recently implemented a phone tree, uh, not very popular, but it's reducing the general non-emergency calls that are going into our dispatch center to free up our dispatchers to actually handle priority calls. And that's a technology that uh, we see is going to help, especially uh, in our center, manage the emergency versus non-emergency calls. We've also increased our amount of non-emergency lines in our dispatch center. So um, if they are busy, you will go into sort of a constant loop until they are able to call. And these are for your non-emergency, hey, I want to make a report, um, you know, I have a cold report, it's not in progress. And uh, we believe that we will be soon meeting the state standard in our dispatch center by actually using this technology. Um, I'm actually going to turn it over to Jeff because he's our PIO and puts out all our press information. And we're doing some um, exciting things um, to not only get crime trip, crime trips tips, but also trips, uh, crime tips, um, but also um, to actually push crime information out to you. So I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, we have, uh, we're working on several different projects right now. Uh, one is Nixle, which is essentially it's a community alert uh, uh, system that allows us, um, you get contacted by uh, a text message or an email of uh, a certain event that's going on with the city. It's very popular, it's, it's free to you, you just sign up. Um, uh, we're still trying to get, iron out some, some issues there as far as um, how we want to, to, what information that we want to put out to you. Um, but it's going to be great for you in, in the community to get some of the alerts, whether it be traffic uh, accident that's causing a traffic jam or uh, a missing child. Um, so we're, we're going to be, that's going to be coming out here soon. Um, one of the other um, uh, tech aspects that we've been working on is a, it's a text to tip. So if you have a, a house, a problem house in your neighborhood, you'll be able to text us, say, hey, I live at, or there's a house at 123 Main Street, and I believe they're dealing dope. We can get that information. Uh, we can actually respond back to your text. Um, and then we have administrators that will be able to get that information, pass it on to the appropriate detectives. You can remain anonymous. Um, that should be hopefully up and running here soon. Um, we also, uh, does anybody sign up for e-notify? Is anybody familiar with e-notify? Um, I was in a meeting today 
You know, currently now with your e-notify system, if I put out a press release, um, you get notified. And Michael, maybe you can comment on this. Um, you get a, an email or a text alert, and you have to get log on to see if a press release was written by me, correct? Well, no, you don't even have to log on. You get an email that has a link. You just click on the link, and you get the, the press release. Okay, now what we're currently working on, and this is a work in progress, but instead of clicking on that link, you get e-notified, my press release is going to pop right up to you. So, um, you know, depending if, you, if your phone's slow like mine and you can't, you know, it doesn't work in certain locations, then now you'll just be able to pull up the information. So, this is something that's very important to the chief is getting out this information, developing that relationship with the community, putting out the information to you. Um, and I think the Nixle, the text to tip, and this, the new e-notify system that we're, we're trying to that we currently have that we're trying to improve are just three different aspects that will hopefully make things a little bit easier for you and obviously it's going to make our jobs easier if uh, we get the positive the feedback from you um, regarding crime or crime trends or things that you're seeing in your neighborhoods. And all our crime activity is now listed, so our logs, it um, loads every hour or half hour or ten minutes. An open call is not going to load because necessarily we might not want you to know what we're doing. So we won't load a call and say, you know, we're here trying to do this. But once the call is closed, it'll load up that we had a call and then what the disposition is. Um, there's confidential calls like um, sexual assaults, calls involving juveniles, or medical calls. These are all confidential, so they will show up that we had a call, but you won't know what it is. So it's deemed by law confidential, so we can't post it there. So I was very, <laughs> so Chief, I was very encouraged uh, to hear um, you know, that you, you really believe in best practices about the GIF staying for a number of years. So can we expect you to stay for four more years? Pardon? Can we expect you to stay in San Leandro for at least four more years? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think the meeting's got the contract in the back. Yeah. 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 So I, I can tell you that, um, you know, there's a match between um, particularly a department head and a city in the community. And for me, this is a great match. Um, I certainly love working here. Um, you know, I'm uh, certainly committed to this job and committed to the community. And, you know, people are saying, we want a time. You know? And, you know, it's not about the time. It's what you do within that time. I really believe. And, you know, personally, I can see myself retiring here, and that's in many, many years. Um, I personally think that there's a lot of good things that, you know, I have to bring to the table that we can continue to do in the community <coughs> the safety aspect. You know, I'm involved in... Um, you know, a statewide association that I'm running right now. Um, I'm, the, I'm going to be the outgoing president in May. Um, there's a lot of issues that local government can impact at the state level. Um, and there's a lot of things going on right now um, in Alameda County and San Leandro that I can bring in as examples. And so um, for me, this is a great fit and I love this community. So I don't see myself leaving it anytime soon. Good. Good. <laughs> Any other questions? What we're going to do is we're going to try and move it. Move it along. Go ahead. Just, no, no, go ahead. No, do you know the next meeting? The, we do not have a date yet for the February meeting. Uh, and the reason for that is, quite honestly, um, the last meeting we had was in the morning, uh, like the others had been. And I think there was this many officers, if not more, and we had three or four uh, folks sitting there. So we kind of outnumbered everybody, and it, uh, it, was, uh, it, it just seemed like we didn't get a lot done. It wasn't real productive. Uh, so we wanted to see what the turnout would be here. Sometimes you don't know because obviously we don't ask for an RSVP. You know, hey, let me know so I can, you know, tell you whatever. Um, so we haven't come up with a date yet, but I guarantee you between now and probably Monday or Tuesday, uh, we'll have a date on the website. Uh, we'll put it out uh, in the Times as well. Uh, and we'll have a location. That's the other thing. We're trying to, you know, spread the wealth, trying to spread it around. What's that? Can you put it on patch? Uh, I can yeah, call Tom, and Tom will do that for me. He'll, yeah, that's uh, good. Very good. Yeah, yeah. It seems like a lot of folks uh, read the uh, read the patch articles, and so that's a good way for information. Yeah. So most likely, there probably will be a meeting in February. Uh, more than likely, yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have several neighbors who couldn't make it tonight. Oh, sure, really sure. Um, and the other thing is, is I wish there was a way. Maybe there is. Uh, we'll get out to some of the organizations like Citizen for Saver San Leandro. Pat's in the back. Uh, to see if folks would rather have it in the evening again or a morning one. 
The first several morning editions uh, that we had Coffee with the Cops, big turnouts. Big turnout. So it's kind of hard to say what, you know. Um, so this worked out well, too. That was right before Christmas. And it was. It was. So that might have been a, uh, an anomaly, I guess. Uh, that, you know, in the location that we had it at, I had a few folks tell me, geez, I didn't even know we had a Hilton Hotel. Oh so, I, you know, I guess if you don't stay there and drive by there, you wouldn't know, right? So, Manor Grill, that would be a good Manor Grill? So, you know, we tossed that around before. The other thing is that we have to have a venue that's, you know, big enough, because we don't want to, you know, stand, I, I don't mind standing close to you, right? But if there's 40 of us standing there talking, to you, it doesn't work out. Any other questions for the panel or anybody that's up here? Anything at all? Okay. Uh, the chief mentioned that Kerry Kovach is my partner uh, in crime prevention. Um, our cards, I'll, I'll leave my business cards here. As you leave, you can pick them up, email me, or call me. It's best to email me. Uh, voicemail, sometimes I, we have this, this new automated, so it kind of gives me a, a version of what you said in text, and uh, that's my entertainment in the morning, uh, because it's absolutely nothing like what you said on the voicemail. <laughs> but I do enjoy it. Um, however, the email is better. So if you have any questions after tonight that you weren't able to ask or you're afraid to ask, but for whatever reason, go ahead and call us. Uh, the chief mentioned that we will go out to your house. We will do that for your business uh, to take a look around and see what you can do better, make some suggestions. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, but we just have to come up with a mutual date and time to do it. So any other questions? We thank you for showing up. It shows that you really care. Thanks a lot. Thank you.